Hello, my name is Emily Mayara. I'm the Deputy Executive Director of FMDV, the Global Fund for Cities Development, an international network of local governments dedicated to promote solutions to finance cities. I'm very pleased to welcome you today for this uh, session on financing lo local transition. Cities and local actors are key stakeholders to achieve the SDGs and the Paris Agreement on Climate. That is why their fi financing the uh, sustainable transition is one of the major challenges of our decade. One feature, a total of 90 trillion US dollars in investment is needed in, uh, in urban infrastructure to mitigate global warming to two degrees by 2030. All over the world, cities have developed solutions to include sustainable development in their strategies and their budget. Yet, they still encounter barriers to access sufficient funding because they can be considered by uh, financial actors as not creditworthy enough, their projects being too small or too risky. Today, I'm happy to welcome great speakers representing the diversity of stakeholders committed into the local finance ecosystem. Local and regional governments, national agencies, climate experts and private investors to exchange on the solutions to bridge this financial gap for the local transition. So uh, let's start the first discussion uh, with uh, Mr. Uh, Adalberto Barreto. Um, I will uh, introduce him. He works at the municipality of Lisbon, where he's responsible for the participatory process. So Mr. Barreto, um, the floor will be yours. Mr. Barreto, could you tell us about Lisbon experience um, uh, working with uh, the development of a green participatory budget, which is a very innovative experience in Europe? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, Emily, so much. Uh, well, let me just say that um, the, the Lisbon participatory budget, which is I'm going to talk a little bit about it, was uh, was created in in 2008 and uh, and it was uh, a project that was not uh, uh, an environmental project it was a project that that uh, that uh, included every activities of the municipality of lisbon uh, activities such as uh, cultural activities security uh, urban hygiene uh, policy and uh, environmental issues uh, uh, as as well. So it was a, a PB covering all activities of the municipality. And in the, in, in, the, in those times in 2008, Lisbon was a, a city that was not very uh, environmental friendly, let's say. It was a city where the car was still the main character in the in 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 in, in in, in the streets, uh, uh, let, 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 let's say. So uh, the, 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 the PB it came to us as quite a surprise that uh, the old, at the beginning in 2008, 2009 and uh, 2010, almost all the projects were environmental projects for the city of Lisbon that were voted on the, were voted on the, on the participatory budget. And this for, for us was like a, a sign, a, a signal that was uh, being given to the elected representatives that uh, uh, Lisbon, uh, uh, the, the, the people of Lisbon wanted a more uh, green or a more environmental policy for, for our city. Uh, so in, in those times, Lisbon before 2008 had no had almost no cycle lanes. We, we could not see uh, uh, a bike rider. It was very difficult to see a bike rider in the streets and it has changed so much in the, in the past 10 years uh, so that uh, today we have more than 100 kilometers of, uh, of cycle lanes and uh, we will have at the end of, the, of, of, this, of this year about 200 kilometers of, of cycle lanes in Lisbon. And they were, in the beginning, uh, projects uh, that were uh, framed by the participatory budget. Now it's 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 in the in the in the in the in the let's say it's in the plan in the strategic plan for the city. It's not 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 necessary anymore. People to vote for 
to vote for uh, cycle lanes, for instance, because they are in the strategic plan pl planned for the for the for the cities for the city. Explain After us. Um, two, sorry, could you explain us how it works uh, concretely? The, the the PB process. Yes. Okay, so the PB process is is a, is a process that uh, the the citizens they they do the proposals, they they do the proposals and they send the proposals to the to to to, to the city hall. Uh, the proposals they they came mainly online, but we have also every year since 2010 uh, uh, citizens assemblies, face to face assemblies. Uh, spread spread out to to in the city, and in these assemblies, they also uh, present their proposals. That after 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 being after the, the proposal enters the city, that it's transformed in a in a pre project for 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 for, for the budget for the municipal public public budget. Uh, and um, this is this is this is the main design. We have uh, we have three cycles in this design. We have a, a decision cycle, uh, which is the cycle that goes from the presentation, the, the planning of the process, till the the voting and the election of the uh, of the projects. Then we have an implementation cycle, which is the the the, the, the implementation, the phase that the the, the the works are being executed. And then finally, uh, an evaluation, an evaluation cycle. So this is the main design of the of the PB project. Uh, as I was saying, the the PB was uh, initially was not a green PB. Well, it was uh, all subjects PB, let's say. And uh, then after this 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 clear message, the, the the policy of the of the of the city of Lisbon. Uh, went with a strong agenda, with, with a strong environmental uh, agenda. Um, then the, 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 we, we had that in, in, 2000, in 2012 uh, a strong, uh, a, a, a strong uh, uh, financial crisis. The crisis began before 2010, but in the budget of the City Hall, uh, it was, its, its impact was in 2012. And this changed a little bit the projects the, because we had less money and people in Lisbon had also less money. That changed a little bit the, the projects that were mainly green projects to a little bit more social social projects, pro projects for the elderly, projects for the for the children. But in this time, the agenda of the city was was uh, was already a strong a strong environmental uh, agenda. And so this meant that in the city, in the in the, in, in, in all departments of the city, all uh, almost all projects had, had to have a, a, a green or a sustainable uh, policy uh, behind those uh, those projects. So Lisbon, with this strong agenda of uh, of envi environmental policies, was elected as green capital in 2020, and we. In the department of participation, we had to, we had uh, uh, begin uh, be, begin with uh, with projects with participative with participatory projects, uh, all uh, focus on green uh, on um, on um, environmental issues. So we had uh, the the school the school PB in uh, in Lisbon in 2019. Which was um, a, a, a PB uh, meant to the children in between the fifth grade and the, the and the, the, the ninth grade, and uh, it was a PB that the the design of this PB was quite different because the the municipality uh, offered a menu of initiatives uh, focused on environmental issues, and the students they did choose. Uh, those uh, the, the initiatives, the projects that they uh, that, that they prefer, let's say, and then we have the the, the green seal it, in in all the participatory projects of of the of the PB. We have the green seal that was given 
to projects presented by citizens that were uh, in environmental projects. And finally, so, we um, have uh, the, in 2020, the Green PB, which was a PB uh, covering uh, only, uh, only areas of, uh, uh, of, inv of environment in, in the city, in the city of, uh, of Lisbon. This PB was, uh, was going to be launched in 2020, but we have to, uh, we, we have to, to postpone the, the PB due to the pandemic. And then we, we, we implemented it in 2021, in the current year. And now we are uh, we are in in the middle of the process. Let's say we have already received two 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 hundred and fifty one uh, two hundred and fifty one proposals. And uh, these uh, these proposals they are they are uh, uh, th these proposals they, they are in in in, in seven envi environmental themes. Uh, uh, and the main, main, main themes that we have received are in, on pollu pollution reduction and preservation of ecosystems, smart and sustainable mobility, climate change adaptation and mitigation, efficient uh, revitalization of the built infrastructure, fair food system, uh, and clean and renewable energy. These Thank are the, the projects that we Thank have you, already Mr. received Barretta. and the voting process, the, the elected projects to be put to vote will be announced next week. Great. Thank you for presenting this really innovative uh, green participatory budget. I think it's the first of this kind uh, in Europe and you make a lot of efforts to include all the categories of citizens uh, into it. So it's a really inspiring uh, experience. And now I'm happy uh, to welcome uh, Mr. Uh, Maxfield Weiss who is the managing director at CDP, which is a non-profit charity to provide the global platform for cities and private actors to measure, manage, and disclose their environmental data. Uh, previously, he created the first supply chain management program based on climate science at Hewlett-Packard Enterprise, and he's been recognized as one of the 75 elite environmental managers in 2018. Mr. Weiss, uh, could you please present the action of CDP in supporting cities in their sustainable transition? How does CDP score cities on their environmental performance and how environmental disclosure supports cities with budgeting? Thank you. Great. Well, Emily, first of all, it's really great to be here and part of this exciting event. I'm really particularly excited to be joined by Aldoberto Barreto from Lisbon Municipality to hear about your innovative environmental work. Uh, but to give you a brief overview of how we support cities, uh, CDP has been working with cities for 10 years now, starting in 2011, and we provide a platform uh, in partnership with ICLEI where cities can uh, report their environmental data. And this is key uh, because for us, data is really the foundation of climate action. And as the old saying goes, you cannot manage what you do not measure. And to survive and thrive, uh, cities must be resilient, they must be healthy and equitable places to live, uh, and preparing for and adapting for climate change and setting uh, science-based decarbonization strategies, uh, that's the ultimate long game, but effective action begins with data. Uh, and more and more cities are seeing uh, that measuring and managing their environmental impacts and risks, uh, this is going to be vital for a future that is resilient. And this has led to a huge growth uh, in city disclosure, which we're really glad to see. And since 2011, uh, there's actually been a 17-fold increase from 48 cities disclosing to now 812 in 2020. Uh, and there's actually 157 cities here in Europe who are disclosing. Uh, and based on this disclosure, we do score cities and we score cities uh, from a ranking from A to D. And in 2020, we had 88 cities on our annual A list, the kind of gold standard, uh, and 33 of them were here in Europe. And the scoring system and methodology that we use is ultimately designed to incentivize environmental action and support cities on their journeys uh, towards environmental stewardship. And the way that we score cities, it really takes a holistic approach and it measures how they're tackling environmental crisis. So we take a look at a city's climate targets, 
uh, their plans, mitigation and adaptation, what actions they're currently taking and their emissions data. And this is really a roadmap for municipal environmental action. And to score this A, a city must fulfill certain criteria. They must have completed a vulnerability assessment, have an adaptation plan, a climate action plan, a GHG emissions reduction target, and a citywide inventory. And of course, most importantly, they must disclose publicly. And this is really key because uh, we believe that disclosure of environmental risk and impacts is a crucial first step towards action. Uh, and the data, it really speaks for itself. So cities who are disclosing through CDP are actually outperforming on urgently needed decarbonization. So we've seen that 42% of disclosing cities' energy mix comes from renewable sources compared just to, compared to just 26% that uh, is the global average. And once cities, this is what the crux of it really is, once they know where those key impacts are, their risks and where their opportunities lie, it's only then that they could focus these resources effectively. Uh, so hopefully this gives you a little bit of a sense of an idea of how CDP works with cities and why disclosure is really so crucial uh, towards financing the sustainable transition. Thank you. Uh, could you tell us how cities can invest in environmental action? So really, you know, I would say that from the perspective of uh, financing uh, and investing, really what we're seeing is, is a key challenge is, in, is that budget is a key barrier for many cities. And there's several uh, reasons for this. And the examples are that there are a few bankable projects, uh, credit worthiness, it's difficult to access uh, existing financing and limited climate finance knowledge is also a factor. Uh, and we recently released a report that shows that cities that one in four of these cities cite budget as a key barrier uh, for implementing climate, climate adaptation measures. Uh, and the report also showed that over half of city climate projects still require financing. Around $42 billion is still needed. Uh, and this is just based on the 800 cities that are disclosing C CDP. So it's a drop in the ocean or a drop in the bucket compared to what is needed to finance the transition for municipalities globally. Uh, and these climate uh, projects require, that require financing are mostly involving transportation, uh, renewable energy, energy efficiency, waste management, water management. So these are really critical projects. But what is clear to us is that financing this transition is a must. There's no question there. Uh, and we've seen the shock uh, that COVID-19 has had on the economy and climate change is gonna be an even bigger shock to cities. So it's key for us that we see that cities are going to recover in the right way. And this economic recovery from cities, it's gotta be prepared with sustainable growth. And if cities are to able to finance this local transition, uh, this needs to come with a number of benefits. And we're seeing that it does, which is really fortunate. On the economic side, uh, we're seeing the creation of green jobs. And we have a recent report that showed in 2019 it found that national governments can unlock nearly $24 trillion by investing in zero carbon cities and create 87 million jobs annually by 2030. And this, of course, uh, should be music to everyone's ears. And it's clear uh, that economic opportunities are significant. But on top of that, there's also social benefits. So cities can reduce air pollution and public health, uh, make them more attractive place for citizens to live. But really when it comes down to it, what is key here is that national governments must prioritize cities when allocating funds. Uh, and we know that COVID-19 stimulus packages are totaling nearly $12 trillion, uh, but just a small portion of pledged COVID-19 recovery funds are committed to cities. And this is really critical because cities play a key role in driving national governments to achieve their own targets. So adequate resources should be allocated to cities so they can tackle this change. But when it comes down to it, cities can't do it alone. Uh, and the bulk of cities' emissions, they're really coming from sources which they can't control. Uh, so we're really excited to see that cities are actually stepping up to this challenge and collaborating with stakeholders. And our data actually has shown that 76% of cities are already working with the private sector on sustainability projects, or planning to do so in the next two years. Uh, in the private sector, it's really gonna be crucial to help unlock funding, right? Yeah. 
Uh, and we're seeing more city business action take place, which is encouraging, uh, but it's not happening at a fast enough scale. And that's why CDP, we're trying to break down these barriers with cities uh, and that they're facing in terms of accessing funds from investors. And one of the ways that we're doing this is through our matchmaker program. Uh, and this is a really uh, cool program that supports cities to access funding for sustainable infrastructure projects. So we're showcasing city projects uh, and we're making them accessible to investors and capital markets for public and private sector collaboration. And the program, it's also providing networking opportunities and webinars and workshops and toolkits to help build the internal capacity of cities, which is also key and support these local governments to bring about these projects to fruition. And we're excited that we now have 34 local governments and they're taking part in this program. We're aiming to link 1,000 climate smart projects to finance uh, by 2025. So there really are some amazing strategies taking place in terms of local transition. Uh, and we of course just heard from Lisbon uh, and we'll be hearing from other cities coming up on their own innovating finance and mechanisms like their green participatory budget but I'm really looking forward to hearing more about this. And I hope that other cities can follow suit as it's really critical that we create an economy that works for people and planet and cities are at the heart of that. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Weiss and Mr. Barreto for sharing such inspiring solutions to strengthen the environmental impact of cities in associations with the citizens. And now I'm happy to welcome uh, the three speakers for the second discussion panel. Mr. Gérard Blanchard, Mr. Arnaud Leroy, and Mr. Thierry Deo. Mr. Blanchard. Après. So, I'm happy to welcome the second panel. I will introduce the speakers. Mr. Blanchard is Vice President of La Rochelle Urban Community in charge of carbon neutrality and Vice President of the region Nouvelle-Aquitaine. He's a researcher in oceanography and marine ecology and was previously President of La Rochelle University. Mr. Arnaud Leroy is Chairman of the Board of Administration of ADEM, the French Agency for Ecological Transition. He graduated in maritime law and marine environment. He has been a member of the French parliament where he worked on sustainable development and has been a reporter of a law on blue economy. And Mr. Thierry Deo, welcome, is the founder and CEO at Meridiam, a leading investor in public infrastructure across Europe, North America and Africa that recently transformed into a benefit corporation. He holds several international responsibilities among which Presidents of Finance for Tomorrow, the branch of Paris Europlace, promoting green and sustainable finance on an international level. Welcome to the three of you. I'd like to give the floor to start to Mr. Blanchard to present us the La Rochelle Territorial Zero Carbon Project, which aims to achieve carbon neutrality thanks to an extremely comprehensive and innovative approach combining environmental evaluation and financial engineering. Please, Mr. Blanchard. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Emily, for this uh, introduction. Uh, first of all, I'm very glad to be uh, with you today to have the opportunity to present uh, our experience in terms of uh, ecological transition in our city of La Rochelle with a focus uh, uh, on the financial aspect. Uh, the territory of La Rochelle I'm going to talk about is uh, located along the French Atlantic coast in the Nouvelle Aquitaine region. It is uh, approximately 300 square kilometers and is made up of uh, 170,000 inhabitants. For more than 40 years, uh, sustainable development has been a major focus of uh, public policies in La Rochelle in terms of urban ecology. Uh, this is why in, in 2017, uh, so recently, we, uh, we decided to take uh, a step further to cope up uh, with a major project to fight climate change locally across our territory. Our approach is, of course, in line with the Paris Agreement for Carbon Neutrality in 2050, but our local objective is more ambitious since we aim to achieve carbon neutrality by 2040. Um, our current carbon footprint is 2 million tons of CO2 equivalent per year, so we have to divide it by four to achieve neutrality in the next 20 years. Uh, such uh, an objective requires, of course, uh, a comprehensive and systemic approach 
to act on all levels of public action. It also requires to find additional funding over very long periods. We have uh, therefore formed a local consortium with the major players in our territory to develop the project and to manage this project. And these players are the urban community of La Rochelle, the city of La Rochelle, the university, uh, the commercial port and the technological park dedicated to low carbon activities. These five actors are responsible for the project. And around them, we have uh, also built uh, an ecosystem of 130 public and private partners who are, uh, who are all key actors of our territory. And the partnership between uh, the major players in the territory uh, is a very important aspect of the project. It is a guarantee of their active and lasting commitment, uh, both in the realization and in the conduct of the project. Uh, this project is called the La Rochelle Zero Carbon Territory, and it includes uh, 70 actions organized in, uh, into seven working areas. Those areas are uh, soft and collective mobility, energy retrofit, uh, the circular uh, economy and in industrial ecology, uh, renewable energy production and collective self-consumption, carbon capture and sequestration in ecosystems, agroecology and local food, and sustainable tourism. The financial need for these uh, actions amount to 80 million euros over 10 years. And to finance this uh, first 10 year stage, uh, corresponding to the in initiation of our project and particularly uh, its 70 actions, uh, we responded to a call for projects from the French state uh, within the framework of the program investment for the future on the subject of uh, innovation territories. Uh, this is a very uh, competitive call for our projects, of which we were one of the, of the winners. And this uh, success enabled us to obtain 25 million euros from the French state, uh, with which we were able to trigger other public uh, and private funding. Uh, and so uh, we got an additional 25 million euros from the Nouvelle Aquitaine region, from the state agency ADEM, and from uh, our local consortium. And also, an additional 30 million euros from our 130 local partners, companies, association, administration, and different kinds of uh, organization. We have, uh, at this stage, we have therefore uh, gathered a total budget of 80 million euros until 2027. And this budget, as I said, uh, is used and will be used to initiate the actions of the project. And it must also produce a ripple effect on all fundings of our public policies. But to go uh, beyond the scope of the La Rochelle Zero Carbon Territory project and to find new, a new funding method for new actions, we have also created what we call uh, the Carbon Cooperative. The role of this uh, Carbon Cooperative is to connect uh, project leaders and financial contributors, and at the same time, we have to be uh, a trusted third party. And the, uh, the cooperative goal is to build a portfolio of greenhouse gas emission uh, reduction projects. It will therefore aggregate uh, small and larger projects. And for uh, each of these uh, projects, the cooperative will calculate the greenhouse gas savings. It will label these uh, amounts of carbon uh, with the objective to uh, convert them into uh, credit carbon, carbon credits. And these uh, credit carbons will then uh, be uh, offered to contributors in a local carbon budget. And these actors uh, are citizens, uh, companies, association, and administration. So um, the cooperative therefore makes it possible to finance locally actions to, uh, to fight climate change. The main advantage of the system is to be able to combine a large number of small projects in the same process. So taken all together, these small projects make it possible to significantly reduce our carbon footprint, and they also create a, 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 a collective dynamics. The cooperative, uh, the cooperative, uh, the carbon cooperative, was officially created uh, last December, so it's a very young uh, structure, which is gaining momentum, and whose challenge now is to uh, constitute as quickly as possible a portfolio of projects to be uh, to be financed. So. Uh, in conclusion, and in this very short presentation, I tried to show you that the uh, originality of our zero carbon approach in La Rochelle 
uh, is the collective action of the players uh, in the territory and the principle of uh, voluntary contributions to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Mr. Blanchard, for this really innovative experience that is today a source of inspiration for major European cities such as the city of Paris. And I'm proud to say that FMDV has supported this project as well as um, the Green Passport Budget of Lisbon uh, through technical assistance. And now I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Leroy. Could you please present us how a national public agency such as the French Agency for Ecological Transition can support the financing of local transition through technical assistance and financial tools. Thank you. Thanks. Good uh, hello to everybody. Just to, to maybe underline what has just been said. Basically, you've got one example. And the, what we can do as a national agency is to promote and to show that we are partner of La Rochelle. We can also help other territories to design their own approach because one of the aspects before speaking about financing it's really to admit that we won't have equivalent solution you know there and there it's national issues or international issues but the solutions are slightly different in la rochelle you you have uh, a wet area that provides you uh, elements and opportunities to capture carbon somewhere else Maybe you are speaking about uh, Lisbon, where you've got the Tagus uh, Delta, you may find other options. The idea is to, to build also on so-called uh, nature-based solution. And if you follow this route, you will have to address the issues according to the territory, mountain, forest, delta, wet area, or even some uh, other elements like river and, 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 and um, big uh, lakes. It's something really essential to say that we are able as national agency to spread solutions that we manage and we try to help at local level. It's an important issue because we are key elements of practicing, of um, sharing best practices as we say in good, uh, in good French. It's one tool, you know, the sharing of experiencing. After we've got finance, that we are able to finance uh, tiny experimentations to bring them to a um, higher level and to scaling up the, the, the uh, potentialities. Second tool, and after we've got program, national program, for example, on uh, adaptation, adaptation of uh, climate change, where we, we try to select 10, 15 territories where we bring methodologies, where we bring tools with the uh, different territories and in a second time, we will try to explain to other territories that we've got already tools and methodologies on shelves, but they have to adapt them to their national, uh, uh, to their local uh, conditions. That's where a national agency as ADEM, and also bringing like expertise, replying to uh, uh, questions from uh, peop elected peoples, because they, sometimes they don't know, they want to do something, they don't have the tool, and as national agencies, we try to bring as well uh, engineers to help and to build solutions. Great, thank you very much. Uh, you demonstrated well the critical role of national public policies to support uh, the transition at the local level. And uh, I'd like to give the floor now to uh, Mr. Deo. Uh, could you please present how s us how a private investor such as Meridiam can support the financing of local transition? How do you align your strategy and portfolio with the global agendas at the glo local level? And how do you overcome the barriers preventing local projects access accessing private investments? Thank you. Well, I'll, uh, very, very briefly, I'll uh, talk a little bit about how in Finance for Tomorrow, but also at Meridium, we see, uh, I mean, the challenges. I mean, our goal is to channel as much uh, financing as possible towards what we call the just transition of uh, territories and communities. Uh, which means a ecological transition, but also uh, trying to achieve the other uh, UN uh, SDGs. And in terms of goals, we also have inclusion and economic um, goals that have to be uh, uh, actually reached. Uh, so it's both environmental and social goals, which makes uh, the challenge at the level of communities quite, quite important, because first, uh, 
One of the big challenges that we, we face is basically the availability of project and the, uh, I would say, the, uh, the engineering of the, the initial projects. Uh, because projects tend to be small, they involve a lot of stakeholders, uh, so there is a certain level of complexity um, that, that is challenging when you want to invest a vast amount of money uh, into those communities. The second one is the affordability. Uh, of, uh, of this project on the long run and this is where the public-private uh, partnership in terms of the funding is quite important uh, in terms of being able to use agencies like ADEM or others to, to actually blend uh, public and private investment into this project to make them affordable and sustainable uh, financially for, uh, for those communities uh, as well. And the last is making sure, and which is what we've done at Meridian by becoming a, a, a Société à Mission or, or a B Corp, by being able to measure, to commit and to measure impact. Because it's quite important when you uh, invest in those communities to be able to uh, anticipate, have an intent in terms of impact and deliver that impact. Because, uh, and as I say, that impact is not only environmental and climate uh, related, but also uh, socially related. I mean, one example that I, that I would give to uh, probably end uh, my, my uh, speech here is uh, what we've developed with uh, uh, UNCDF and the Rockefeller Foundation, and FMDV is also very much involved, which is the International Municipal uh, Investment Fund, also called the Urban Resilience Fund, focusing on community with two things. One being able to bring resources and funding to develop projects and prepare projects, because that's quite uh, the bottleneck, I would say. Uh, and second, uh, additional money to, uh, to invest in those projects, so to be anchor investors in those projects and to attract uh, further capital around. And in this, this second part of, of the fund, we have actually have a blended uh, finance approach because uh, we have a number of, uh, of international finance institutions and uh, development banks that are allowing private investors to come into this with a very long run and long term objectives, uh, but with uh, a de-risking approach to it. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to ask both of you uh, to answer in a few words uh, to the question, what are the conditions to enable uh, the development of public-private financing for local projects, what is called also blended financing? Quickly, I think the, we are we reach a time where one of the conditions to succeed in the uh, transition, just transition and ecological transition, is to stop to invest in uh, so-called brown projects. Really clear. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Deo? I mean, I, I, I think the objective needs to be clear. Uh, I think uh, when public money focuses on uh, de-risking these projects, promoting these projects, and mobilizing as much private uh, money as possible, I think the alignment is quite easy. Thank you so much to uh, all the panelists. You demonstrated well uh, that when we work together in good cooperation, it's really possible to develop solutions to finance uh, local transition together. Thank you so much. And uh, now I will call for the third panel with Mr. Koras, Mrs. Koras Melik and Mr. Mr. Magnus Burson. Thank you. Hello, uh, so I'd like to introduce my, uh, the, the last panelists. Uh, Mrs. Smelik is Regional Minister for Sustainable Development in the province of Flevoland in the Netherlands. She had worked as an interpreter in Turkish language and for the Le Netherlands Embassy in Turkey and Morocco. And she was also a director at the Social Insurance Bank and uh, at two regional en environmental agencies in the Netherlands. And Mr. Magnus Bertson is the president of the Assembly of Re European Regions and Air 20 Regions for Climate Action. He's also regional minister of environment and vice president of the regional council of Vastra, Gotaland in Sweden. Welcome. 
So in this last panel, we will focus on the specificity of the regional level to support the financing of local transition. Could you uh, tell us in your few words uh, what is the value added of the regional level in this regard? Please, Mrs. Melik, if you want to start. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, yes, as a province, we are intermediate level. So we have the national government, which has national uh, ambitions and goals. Uh, and we have the provinces, uh, which is intermediate level. And then we have the municipalities. And uh, for us as a province, uh, we are also a member of the Assembly of European Regions. We have uh, quite a good uh, esteem of what the regions can uh, do in this regional, trans in the national transitions. And we can coordinate, stimulate, we can co-finance, um, for example, uh, 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 new innovations. We can uh, provide co uh, uh, regulations to steer in the right direction, and we can provide knowledge and uh, also uh, uh, do some networking. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Bertson, what is the added value of the regional level? Yes, thank you very much, Emily. Uh, the regional governments are, are developing and implementing a wide range of, of uh, mitigation and adoption policies and investments. Uh, according to the OECD, subnational governments spending uh, has accounted for 64% of public investments in, in sectors with impact on the environment and including climate change. Regional regions uh, have also a vital role to play in linking urban and rural areas in the way that uh, promote mutual benefits and deliver just uh, sustainable and resilient outcome in the context of climate change, following both uh, urban and rural areas to successfully reduce emissions and adopt uh, to the impacts of, of the climate change. Uh, and that's why the Assembly of European Regions has uh, been using its uh, power to uh, showcase the vital role of regional governments in delivering the green transition toward a climate neutral uh, neutrality uh, to establish multi-level uh, governance processes and increase uh, technical and financial support for, for regional governments to undertake uh, their uh, climate actions. Thank you. Uh, this is precisely the theme of uh, the next question. Could you please share with us inspiring experiences of financial tools developed by regional institutions to support the financing of the local transition? Mrs. Melik? Yes, as our province, we uh, we have a lot of space. Uh, we have we have a lot of uh, open area. So uh, what we started with was uh, in, in the early days with uh, wind turbines. But we have spotted that the wind turbines uh, in, in the beginning were just uh, uh, small um, initiatives. Uh, they were not be, uh, uh, working together. So what we wanted to do for the next generation of wind turbines is to coordinate uh, on a level uh, that we have one uh, huge wind park uh, with turbines, but also to have a financial impact uh, that is not only uh, uh, good for in, uh, investors with a large uh, uh, deep pockets, but also for the local community. So what we have done is that we have set some regulations, but before uh, the initiative uh, can have, have, a, have a permission, they should show that they uh, have possibilities for local people to invest uh, and, and to have uh, investment bonds uh, uh, to participate into this project. So now we have uh, a lot of participants into this project who have financial benefits. And also we said to the initiative uh, uh, that they have to uh, provide a certain amount of money in a, a local fund to, uh, uh, to improve the landscape and to improve the living environment of this uh, turbine park. Uh, and the second thing is that there were also all turbines that have to be disseminated. And we have set a regulation that they uh, had an obligation to remove the old uh, turbines uh, and, and, and to, when they put the new ones, that they have a good alignment with the environment uh, and also with the local uh, uh, financial uh, possibilities for the uh, people living in our area. They see that this is a really a cooperative uh, uh, investment. 
it's not only a, an economic and, uh, and, and a technical innovation, it's also a social innovation. And you see that the people who accept those windmills, uh, the amount of uh, acceptance goes, rises uh, enormously when people get the opportunity to also financially invest and profit from the benefits that come from such a turbine uh, uh, a park. So uh, I think that's a good example that might be inspiring for other regions. Thank you so much. It's really inspiring to see how you developed uh, such an innovative financial tool that can allow the participation of citizens. Mr. Benson, um, would you like to share an experience? Yes, thank you. Uh, take an example from my home region of Västergötaland in, in Sweden. And we have adopted a carbon, um, a carbon uh, budget to ensure that our climate work is in line with the Paris uh, Agreement. Uh, we now have a tool created by the University of, of Uppsala that shows how uh, emissions must be reduced ev every year. And you can clearly see that delaying action is not an option if uh, climate policy is to be in line with, with the recommendations of, of, of science. So uh, there is now an international accepted um, model for, for carbon budgets. So. Uh, you can see uh, your present situation and you can compare results and, and if mapping all the territories of, of the world, uh, w then we can see uh, that we will um, uh, achieve the goals of, of the Paris uh, Accord. Um, the region uh, of Västergötaland has also supported our 49 uh, municipalities also in, in their work of, of making uh, climate uh, budgets by themselves uh, using this model. To support uh, our climate work, uh, a research council is now being appointed to gather different uh, competences to um, issue uh, of um, uh, climate change uh, that will produce an annual report that, that shows the measures that, that are needed to achieve to um, for, for, for to achieve this uh, climate our climate goals of course um, this shows uh, that we have a lot to do uh, right now the the decrease uh, rate per year uh, is on on 16 percent uh, 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 every year so uh, we have a lot of work to do but we have also a, a lot of ambitions so we, we are getting there thank you very much um, and the last uh, question uh, would be uh, can you share inspiring experiences of, of multi-stakeholder partnerships developed by your regional institution to support the financing of local transition please mr benson yes thank you Yes, as I said, this is nothing we can just take a political decision, neither on the national, global or, or regional or local level. We need to cooperate with all these different stakeholders, as we also heard earlier today. And cooperation is the key word. And in a broad cooperation with our regional business community and the univers universities in our area, we have decided uh, on a joint goal to, to be a fossil and neutral um, uh, ter territory in 2030, so very ambitious goal, including uh, as also stakeholders from other parts of, of the public side as well as, as, as the uh, civil society. We have a strong uh, industry on, in uh, automotive industry and, 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 uh, and they, therefore I will give you an example from, from the, the, the sector of, of um, sustainable transportation. Uh, where we started under the, uh, the umbrella name Electric City, uh, where we had a demo area of fully electrified buses lines, buses in, in, in Gothenburg, and that has now led to Europe's largest procurement of, of electric buses. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, we put it also in a, a system. So after three years of the test of you, these, batteries of the buses, they are now um, used in a new trial, uh, electrically uh, provided by solar cells, they will be stored uh, like batteries in new uh, housing areas. And another interesting example from this is also to showcase the 
impact on, on public uh, planning because the University of Chalmers in Gothenburg, they, they built an indoor bus stop. Uh, first, they built it inside a, a public library just to really showcase the new opportunities with, with urban planning, with a silent and emission-free public transportation. So, of course, researchers are, are uh, closely studying the, the indoor uh, climate, but it opens up a lot of opportunities. And we continue to focus on electrification of the commuter ferries and uh, construction sites, air quality studies, and, and many more things on, on, on the urban um, planning. So uh, these goals that we, we have on making our region fossil free on 2030, they, uh, then we focus on mainly on four different areas. It's sustainable transportation, as I give an example of, and climate smart and healthy food. And the third one is renewable and resource efficient products and, and services. And finally, also healthy and climate smart homes and buildings. So there is a much we can do if we work together. And as also said before, we need to spread the results afterwards because we don't, uh, we, we um, all of us, we, we uh, gain if we can take good examples and best practice from others. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Bredson. Uh, Mrs. Melik, would you like to share an, e an experience of multi-stakeholder partnerships to support uh, the financing of local transition? Yes, we have a lot to choose from. I don't know where to begin, but I think at the beginning, if you have a national uh, regional development agency where you have funds and loans and vouchers uh, where you can uh, help uh, innovations out, you, give, you should give them a direction towards sustainability, and that's what we do in our province. But what is also a very interesting development is that next uh, to the, the formal uh, uh, governmental layers, we also have social economic uh, systems uh, where we work together with municipalities, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, other uh, governments, and also uh, the, the educational system. And that we do that in the greater region of Amsterdam, which is our neighbor. Uh, we have in the metropolitan region of Amsterdam we have uh, a, an assembly of uh, governments uh, who work closely together with the educational, uh, not only higher education, but also vocational training uh, and with the entrepreneurs to make uh, steps into the, towards the transition. One thing that we have said uh, as go local governments is that we have a lot of buying power. If we combine all our procurements and make it a sustainable procurement, then we can uh, really ignite the transition of the entrepreneurs. We can help them to ensure that there is a market for the innov innovative projects uh, on sustainability. So what we have done uh, is that we have uh, made for, uh, together with the educational uh, and, and, and uh, knowledge institutes and entrepreneurs, we have made some roadmaps for certain uh, uh, buying packages like procurement uh, uh, advices so that all municipalities and uh, regional governments like the provinces of the north of Holland and Flevoland all have uh, the same uh, system in which they do their procurement in a sustainable way. So that's the way where we can learn from each other. We work together with the, uh, with the private sector because they know uh, what is, uh, uh, what is what, which innovation uh, can be stimulated in that way. So that is what we are uh, quite proud of. Uh, and the second thing is that uh, it was mentioned earlier this morning, the COVID-19 uh, crisis is, is a very large crisis, but we are awaiting another crisis, which is the climate and the biodiversity crisis. So we, as local governments, have said to each other, uh, if we want to recover from this crisis, we should not go back to the old economy. We should go back forward to a new economy, and we should uh, put the hands together with uh, the entrepreneurs and the uh, education uh, and the knowledge institutes to uh, make kind of green deals to recover in a, in a better way, so that we come out of this COVID-19 crisis in a better, innovative way, uh, and one of the examples of a green deal that we have uh, uh, we are preparing now is the housing. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, need for new houses in the Netherlands, and we want to ensure that those houses are made on a bio-based material and a, with a circular uh, uh, aspects to it. Uh, so now we have set a goal that 20% of the new houses should be 
bio-based, uh, wood, wooden uh, uh, based houses that can be uh, made from reusable material. And we're working closely together with entrepreneurs and the educational systems on, on that project. Thank you so much. So I think we're getting to the end of uh, this panel. Uh, thank you so much to both of you. And um, now I'd like to thank uh, all the panelists, uh, all the great and uh, committed panelists that took part in into the discussion, uh, that presented uh, really uh, lively uh, innovations that have been developed uh, by all families of uh, stakeholders. We heard about uh, the participation of citizens through green participatory budget in Lisbon. Uh, we learned about how to develop data and methodology to nourish uh, the local sustainable uh, development policies. We learned about how to aggregate small projects in order to, uh, for them to access financing. Uh, we heard about how um, uh, can uh, national and uh, regional governments support uh, the financing of local transition through technical assistance, methodology, and financial instruments. We learned about how to develop uh, public-private partnerships in order to leverage uh, private funding to support the local financing transition. All these solutions are being uh, developed and implemented by local stakeholders, by local governments all, all around the world. And we can really learn uh, from each other uh, in order to uh, scale up and adapt these uh, innovations and solutions to uh, the local context and in order to finance uh, a better future for, for the world. Thank you very much. Have a very nice day.